dark, cold world out there. There's a time to live and a time for a man to die. There are places for dead men in the earth and the sky. Don't you venture too far now, cause you can't come back from the place where Hello everybody and welcome back to a new edition of Ring Respect Radio right here on the Video Bros Network. I am Bobby Munson and I am joined with my partner in crime. He is the man with the angelic voice. He is Papa Smoke. Sir, how you doing? I'm doing great, Munson. And how am all my wrestling people doing out there? We hope everybody is out there having a good time, staying safe, and loving your live wrestling action as the world is kind of bound back to some normalcy here at the end of 2021, Papa Smokes. We're winding up the year pretty quick here, uh, getting into the holiday season, in fact, pretty soon. And, you know, we were doing some talking and stuff. You know, it's been just over a year that we've been doing Ring Respecting the way we have. And what a year it has been. 2021 has been quite the uh, up and down for the wrestling scene, as well as for uh, being able to put content here out on the channel. But we've made it uh, quite interesting, and I think we've gone a long way here this year. And I don't know, Pop Smokes, I think we're going to have a bit of a casual day today. We're going to be talking about the MLW War Chamber, but I thought we'd just kind of, you know, reflect on wrestling and shoot the shit as bros here today. Talk a little bit about uh, whatever's on our mind. Uh, before we get started with any of that, though, I'm going to ask everybody tuning in right now to go ahead and click the subscribe button down below, turn on the notification bell, so you know anytime we release new material here on the Video Bros Network. Also going to give a quick shout out to our good friends at Backbreaker Media. Backbreaker Media, where you can catch recaps of Ring Respect Radio on their networks, on their podcast stations as well. So go and upvote them. Make them one of the top podcasts that there is out there today. Help out our good friends at Backbreaker Media. And also, hey, shout out to the Canadian Wrestling Network. We know you guys have been big supporters of Ring Respect Radio as well. And hey, you know what? Quick shout out to my friends over at Love Wrestling who have also been supporting our show and tuning in as well too. So thank you everyone who has joined us over the past year and some for this show and continues to show us some support. I know it means the world to me and also I'm sure it does to you as well, Pops and Mokes. It's good. It's one thing about uh, the business shutting down over the past uh, year and a half, two years, is that we couldn't get much comment, con content to put on this channel. But, you know, you and I have just been talking about wrestling the whole time, put, putting a lot of episodes in the can, and that's the way to just keep busy at it, just keep working at it. We got a whole ton of episodes on our channel now, and uh, we encourage everybody to check those out. We're going to keep up putting out new ones, too. We sure are. We uh, Hopefully, anyone who's tuning in right now, if you ever want any uh, topic brought up here on Ring Respect Radio, you got something that you want Papa Smokes and I to answer, to talk about, anything of the sort, please let us know in the comments below. We want to do everything we can, watch some wrestling with you, anything we can to help boost our channel up and have some fun with you, the fans that continue to keep us in support as well. Uh, speaking of sport, you know, while you're at it, why don't you go check out Prairie Pro Wrestling over on YouTube. We've got some great matches over there. Papa Smokes and I have loved calling the matches for Prairie Pro. Uh, we're going to have some new ones too. We had our live event, uh, New Beginning, that happened just recently. I'm kind of in the midst right now of Papa Smokes going through the footage. There's some great stuff that went down at a New Beginning. I'm getting pretty excited going through the footage once again, being able to put together some new wrestling stuff that we put had been a part of and I, I'm really looking forward to calling these matches with you that's uh, some good looking uh, work that we got done there that's uh, going to be coming out here hopefully very soon and what a dream it was to finally be back at Cosmo Center with all our boys with all our fans with all our staff what a great time it was exhilarating to come back after almost two years and uh, the, the guys put on a great show it was so well attended such quality matches and uh, everything else. We worked hard on uh, on our filming as usual, and uh, we'll throw this up with some commentary once uh, once you get a chance to go through all those uh, camera edits and uh, put together the show. Now, speaking of Prairie Pro Wrestling, Bob Smokes, this is kind of one of the topics I wanted to kind of shoot the shit about here tonight because uh, the last time we kind of spoke and uh, did a Ring Respect Radio, you had brought up a very interesting idea here for the channel that I think we're going to definitely go forth with and uh, start to look into and talking about uh, doing a bit of a like I guess a, a promotion or a, a, you know what you know I, it's better if I let you explain what the idea is pop smokes to the fans listening I think you'd be better at explaining it 
But uh, gonna let you take the take the reins on that. Okay, sure. Well, as you guys all know, I like to watch a lot of old wrestling. Uh, I prefer to watch not just matches, but old TV shows. You know, I like to watch uh, the Portland stuff from the 70s and 80s. I like to watch uh, Texas uh, WCCW. I like to watch uh, Georgia Championship Wrestling, Continental, all this stuff from the 60s, 70s, 80s type thing. And I came to notice one thing that a lot of those shows have, have in common, and it's a popular spot in there which for lack of a better term I'll call personality profile and this is uh, it's a little uh, five or ten minute segment of the show where we can uh, focus in on on one of the wrestlers involved in the promotion and just uh, give them the time to uh, just uh, open up to the fans we, we can give some facts about them and some uh, background information this is all just for the fans basically and the viewers of uh, PPW TV show on YouTube that uh, they can get to know the, the the wrestlers themselves a little bit better. Maybe this could include some uh, personal and background and historical information about their career and such. Maybe some clips of uh, old matches, maybe a full old match or something, or, or a current match for that matter too, but anything that the uh, fans can kind of sink their teeth into and uh, get to learn a bit about the wrestlers they watch each month in Saskatoon and uh, you know, I've watched some of these shows like uh, NFL Films and stuff where they'll just pick a player and highlight the player. You learn everything about them. It makes a favorite out of those guys that get a segment like that uh, because sometimes you you didn't realize you liked a person because you didn't know what their background was. So I just thought this might be a good idea for uh, for our PP, PPW Revolution TV show and uh, uh, we're going to try it out and see if you guys like it. I think it's an excellent idea, Pop Smokes, and I think we are going to try it. Uh, definitely do those uh, profiles that are going to be up on PPW, and you know maybe we'll even tease some of it over here. And speaking of PPW and things uh, to do with PPW, we're going to have a special guest here on the show. I am going to be having an interview that is going to be taped later in the week here, but as this comes as a release altogether, this will also be included on this episode of Ring Respect Radio. We're going to be talking to our good friend, Phil Deadly. I've been looking forward for a while to being able to sit one-on-one -on -one with Phil Deadly and chat with him. I've known him for quite a few years, as you have you, Papa Smokes. Wonderful individual, great talent inside that ring, and he's been uh, doing some marvelous work for us over at Prairie Pro Wrestling. Always there, entertaining the crowd, and you know what? Phil Deadly, I think, uh, was just in the hearts of everybody that was there in attendance at the most recent PPW show as he came out in uh, many different many different forms to have a little bit of entertainment during our gimmick battle royal that evening and i don't think one fan left not talking about how entertaining phil deadly really made that night for them yeah and that's just it i think as popular as some of these wrestlers are i think they would be more so if the fans knew them just a little bit better like we do we we have the advantage of meeting them behind the scenes a little bit and all that but uh, we will thought it might be a nice idea to let the fans in on some of that stuff too and get to know some of our wrestlers a bit better hello everyone and welcome to ring respect radio an exclusive interview here i am here with phil deadly ppw's very own how are you doing this evening i'm doing pretty good man thanks for having me Oh, thank you very much for doing the show. Very glad to have you here. Uh, unfortunately, Papa Smokes couldn't make it to join the fun here tonight as he usually would. But, you know, it's uh, great to be able to sit down, have a one on one with you. Uh, we've gotten to know each other uh, a little bit over the years, working together uh, behind the scenes of uh, both Prairie Pro Wrestling and High Impact Wrestling as well. But I thought I'd yeah. take this opportunity to sit down and just get to know you a little bit better and let everyone else get to know uh, Phil Deadly, you had to know where your whole story started. So just kind of wondering, uh, where did the Phil Deadly story start? Where were you born, raised, uh, and when did you first become interested in pro wrestling? Well, uh, I was born here in Saskatoon. Um, like pretty much once my parents came to Canada, I was born, I'd say, not too long after, maybe two or three years after. And as for when I started watching wrestling, I have no idea. I just always remember watching, like, watching. It was always on. Um, my clearest memory is, like, I remember uh, my first VHS I bought was, uh, I think, the 1992 Royal Rumble, where it was uh, uh, Ultimate Warrior versus 
I believe Sergeant Slaughter uh, and Warrior had uh, the championship going in and Macho Man, I remember coming in and costing the Warrior the, the match. Therefore, Slaughter getting uh, the big win. Oh, man. Um, yeah, I think, that was, I think that was the first, I think the first wrestling pay-per-view match that I've seen that I, I actually like remember. Like, uh, but like, I, I don't know when exactly I started watching it. Yeah, just one of those things that was always on. Yeah, it was, it was always on. And I remember one time my dad told me a story that uh, he asked me if I wanted to go to the Sastel Center uh, to watch. I guess they were, cut, they were in town and it was when uh, Bret Hart was going against Ric Flair to win his nice. first world title. Okay. And he asked me, do you want to do you want to do you want to go? And I'm like, oh, is Ultimate Warrior going to be there he's like oh i don't think so no i'm good then and then oh, now no. uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 i remember i remember being at that show myself too so you yeah, definitely like, missed uh, out <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah like i was a huge uh like ultimate warrior fan like i think he was probably the person that got me into into wrestling just like the whole like he had like the, everything, like the look, like the long hair, like the cool tassels, that that guitar entrance. I'm like, oh, good god, man! Like you know, you know, it's <laughs> like a rock star. Exactly, yeah. And so, yeah, uh, I think he was the first wrestler that I gravi- gravitated towards to growing up. And then, like you know, as I got you know older, you know, like uh, like the Shawn Michaels, like the Bret Hart, uh, all that stuff. Um. Yeah, so I, I watched wrestling pretty much all through my childhood. Uh, and then in high school, I looked up uh, wrestling schools like on dirt sheets. And, uh, and like, you know, at that time, being 16 in Saskatoon and Saskatchewan in like the early 2000s, you're seeing all these schools like listed, like, um, uh, like the Malenkos had, had a school. Uh, Mr. Perfect had a school uh, like the dungeon, even though that was in Calgary. To me, that was like pff, a million miles like away from a 16 year old, you know? Yeah. And so like as I went through high school, I still watched it. And then I was like, uh, I think I towards my senior year, I found a local promotion in the city here, uh, Pro Outlaw Wrestling. And uh, I, uh, I asked my parents, my mom, if I could be a wrestler, and she just had like a heart attack. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thing is, that thing is, like with um, like there's a joke with like immigrant like families when like they all they want their kids to do is like doctor, lawyer, uh, like engineer. Those are like the top three like professions that yeah. they want you to be in. And then, like when I said wrestling, like it was like she had a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh. You always got to surprise the parents a little bit every once in a while. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. And so it's just like, oh, when you're done school, whatever, like you can do whatever you want. And then I turned 18 and then she was like, no, you're not. You're not doing that. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It seemed like less of a fad at that point. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So and the- then no, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say it. So from there, that would have uh, progressed your interest. You took up the uh, training them at that point. Uh, no. So like, I guess, uh, like as I, after I finished high school, I kind of like just stopped watching it. Like I kind of just turned into more of a casual viewer. Like, I think the last big angle that I remember watching, uh, before I kind of like dropped off was like the whole invasion angle. Oh yeah. Remember that? Yeah. So kind of after that, I kind of stopped uh, watching and granted that like at that time I, I just turned like, like 19 so i was busy like partying like living that bar star <laughs> life and so i had like other priorities than watching like monday night raw if you know what i'm saying oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was there too. <laughs> yeah. and so you know then as i got older i just kind of stopped watching it uh like my other passion besides wrestling was music actually and so uh, like i was trying to pursue that like uh i was trying to be an audio engineer so that would be like mixing mixing and recording bands like there are there are audios yeah so like vocals and instruments and all, and all that stuff so uh like i moved to alberta to work on the rigs uh to save up a couple of money and i was going to go to vancouver and pursue music that was my 
that was like my uh like my goal and so i lived in edmonton for you know a couple of years and by that time i heard about lance storm school but i had no i guess interest in kind of like pursuing rest like pursuing wrestling because I was, I was happy doing music so i was like uh, if i i was like if i couldn't do wrestling and uh, but i but uh, no if i wasn't doing wrestling but i could do music i would be uh, i'm a happy camper you know yeah and so uh i followed mu- my passion for music uh, i i called a bunch of studios in edmonton asking hey i'm just looking to learn the business can you would you be willing to take on a free like intern essentially you don't uh, i'll come in work for free and one one company uh, i believe they were called tough house studios based out of edmonton they uh, gave me a shot stuck with them for a good couple of years and what had happened was uh, over the christmas break the studio had gone robbed and so we were out of business for a good couple of years because I guess the owner of the building didn't set the security alarm for the holidays. And so, yeah, so there was a, yeah, so we're kind of SOL. Yeah. And then, so I moved, moved back home, uh, moved back home, kind of tried to figure out like a new plan on, on uh, where to go in life. Music was still an option, but I didn't. I just didn't expect uh, that to happen. So uh, I don't know. Yeah, it took me a good couple of years to kind of figure out where I wanted to go, uh, and then somehow I ended up in Vancouver, uh, going to school for music. Uh, I, I locked out. Uh, you know, I had, a, I had a nice car, so I, that kind of paid for my education. Sold that. And while I was out in Vancouver uh, pursuing music, uh, that's when I started getting back into watching wrestling. Uh, I guess because I had a lot of free time, and you know, I was living, I was living with my brother, and he worked, you know, like all the time. And so I, I don't always be home by myself, like on Monday nights. So what better way to spend Monday night? Yeah, was Monday raw. night raw? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so at first I just started kind of, you know, casually watching it, like not really being invested. And maybe after a year of watching it, what really got me hooked back into, it, I guess, was like that, like that, uh, like that, that, I guess, CM Punk, like pipe, uh, pipe bomb. Yeah. Granted, this is like after like, you know, like I, I didn't see the rise of John Cena, the rise of like Dave Batista. Like I knew who they were, but like I just like you know I didn't see their rise to stardom. So like I wasn't as as invested into say like these other guys, uh, like everyone else is now. Or like you, know, like, do you get what I'm trying to say? Oh, for sure. Yeah, definitely, man. Yeah. And so when I saw that CM Punk promo, like, oh man, I thought this was like straight up shoot. I'm like, holy, I'm like, what is he saying? And all this kind of stuff, you know? And then I remember running home after school to watch that show. Uh, that was like after the Raw on the score, like uh, like Aftermath with uh, Renee Young and uh, Jimmy Corderas. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think after that, that's when I really got hooked. And then unfortunately while i was in vancouver my uh like mother passed away oh sorry sorry to hear that no it's okay man yeah it's it's like it's been quite some time and like she she died pretty pretty young at like 56 due to breast cancer Uh and so i was like man like you know like life is really short you know yeah and so like after uh after i'd finished school i came back to saskatoon um you know trying to kind of figure stuff out and i was like man uh like left to be gone at an at a instant you know and you, you only get one shot at life and i was i was like i was getting pretty up there in age where i was like if i was gonna do wrestling you know like this would be like the time to do i think i was like 20 at this point i was like i think like 26 okay yeah so i was like man it's either like now or never so you know, uh, I went, I ended up going to, uh, 
I think the WrestleMania when The Rock came back for yeah. his first match. Uh, was that 28, 27? It's got to be in there somewhere. <laughs> my, yeah. my memory's yeah. foggy at this point. I'm getting too old. <laughs> yeah, man, me too. <laughs> and so I was like, I, w- I went to uh, that, that WrestleMania and I was like, man, I was just like enthralled by everything. Like, you know, just like everything. And I was like, man, like, like I, I was like, I have to, that, that was, that was the nail in the coffin. Like I, I'm, I'm doing this. Yeah. And I sent an email to uh, Lance Storm's wrestling Academy. And like, he was like, Oh yeah, we got one spot left. So if you don't hurry up, uh, you'll miss the fall class. So like I, you know, sent him like uh send the deposit, a picture. And that was, that was, uh, that, that was it. Yeah. Oh yeah, I got a funny, yeah, quick funny story about Lance. Uh, so I sent the money, and like I, uh, I flew into Calgary, and uh, he had a, I guess a rental house that he, that he was renting out to students, mm-hmm. but he didn't give me the address for the house or the address for the school. So I remember flying into Calgary, and like I'm just like waiting in like I don't know at, uh the terminal, like I have nowhere where to go. I'm like looking in the phone book for Storm Wrestling Academy. I couldn't <laughs> find it. Then all of a sudden I see like this guy coming out, like coming out wearing nothing but like Under Armour, looking like he's modeling for a sports check magazine. And I just see this big Jack bald guy like walking towards me. I'm like, oh, and then he's like, and like I knew who it was, but like, I don't know if he, like if he was there for me or just for like something else. Yeah. And I'm just like, like, just like looking at him and then he just approaches me. He's like, uh, filming. He's like, yep, come on, come on with me. Go, oh, okay. And then, um, uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, so how was the experience, uh, being at the Lance Storm Academy? What was it like there? Oh man, it was, it was great, man. Actually, it was very, like, it was seeing like a, like a professional wrestling ring, like up close, uh, was, was like holy i was like holy man like this is like i've only seen this thing on like tv you know like on on raw and nitro you know so i'm like just seeing that like up close you know like seeing like a fed ring right there it was oh it was just like i was like a little kid you know yeah <laughs> yeah it's just, it's almost surreal when you actually get up that close for the first time ever and oh man yeah experience it so. oh yeah it was and yeah. uh like i remember that uh the first day of uh training was just nothing but like just cardio drills and yeah. he warned us you know like oh so tomorrow i got everybody uh have a light breakfast uh trust me so you know i'm like oh i think we'll be good you know and so like you know I, <laughs> and so oh and like maybe man like after like the first like first round man like i've honestly like felt like quit i think that was the only time i actually like felt like maybe i'm not cut out for this just like this the the cardio man and like he said that the number one rule is whatever you do don't puke in the ring yeah. and like i think one person didn't make it out of the ring and that was oh, uh, no. <laughs> yeah <laughs> that was yeah that was quite the lecture afterwards yeah but man no it was just like it was just uh like a fantasy camp like i don't know like i was just like uh like in a daze like it went by like it was like a three-month program yeah. from september to from september to december and honestly like looking back it went by so fast just like the blink of an eye you know like five days a week it was probably like yeah it was probably the one of like the funnest things of let's just that process like you know like looking back like you know like going to train for wrestling with like lance Storm, someone that you watched on tv like growing up you know like some somebody that i have like a childhood connection to, you know, and this, this guy's like your teacher, like your instructor, your, your friend, your, my landlord at the time, cause I was living at his house, so, <laughs> like his rental house. So yeah, it was crazy, man. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Big land storm fan myself. So I can understand yeah. how starstruck you'd have to be. So, Oh yeah. Uh, but from uh, there, did you continue to uh, wrestle in Alberta after that? Or were you right back to Saskatoon shortly after? Yeah. So after uh, the, uh, training with Storm, I came back to uh, Saskatoon. Um, I had really like, no idea how to get 
bookings, but uh, there was a guy there that I was training with. He was already an experienced uh, guy and a, a tremendous guy. His name was uh, Kamikaze. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you ever uh, seen him. He's, he's done work for High Impact Wrestling, so I don't know if you ever I'd seen him. Didn't seen him cross work paths or. with him personally, Phil. Yeah, but no, this guy is probably like the nicest guy I've ever met, like in this business so far. And like, there's, I don't think you'll hear a bad thing about him. Nice. But he, he helped me get my first booking for uh, Gold Dragon Wrestling out in Moostra. Yeah, I'm familiar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, no, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, I was familiar. I think uh, I can't remember the dude's name that owned the company, but I, I spoke to him on many occasions myself, too. Oh, yeah. I think, uh, guys, I think his name is Jan. Jan yes. Armstrong. Yeah, yeah, there it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And so, yeah, uh, I had my first match with them. Uh, my first opponent was a guy named Blake Broadway. Uh, the match is uh, probably like every first first person's match, just the <laughs> drizzling uh, shits. Yeah. yeah, yeah. A little rough around yeah. the edges. <laughs> oh, yeah. I just wanted, I just like, the, I asked, like, before I had my match, I asked, I emailed Lance, hey, I'm having my first match on this day. Like any last, any like quick advice? He's like, yeah, just get in and get out. I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but uh, so, uh, oh, sorry, you know sorry, no, no, you go ahead. Sorry, I interrupted. So. No, no, I was gonna tell just like uh, like an, just like after that, uh, there's a funny story kind of like after that event for Gold Dragon, we went to out for wings at this famous place in Moostra. I think they're called like Deja Vu or something. Uh, yeah, yeah, and so. And uh, okay, so we go there. We order like our, our wings and whatnot, and like uh, I ask for the bill, and the guy's like uh, Jan, the promoter. He's like, "Oh, it's just uh, just don't worry about it for right now." I'm like, "Oh, okay." So then, like, so then, okay, so I, like I'm assuming it's paid for. So I leave. So I walk out. I leave, and then uh, I where I leave, and then I think uh, maybe a couple hours later. Uh, one of the boys like uh, messaged me on Facebook. He's like, "Hey, Phil, why did you, why did you do that?" I'm like, "What do you mean? Like the dine and dash? I'm like, what do you mean dine and dash? <laughs> At uh, deja vu? Uh, like your 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 order? No, I was like, yo, I I asked him. Oh no, I asked for the bill. I was going to pay. Jan said, "Hey, don't worry about it." Me being na- naive, I guess. Oh, don't worry about it means I got it. So uh, I walk out. I'm like, okay, I gotta drive back home. I work in the morning, and so I leave. And it's like, oh no, Jan. Oh, Jan was hot. Like, yeah, you had to pay your bill. The boys were hot. Then I'm like, oh well, uh, well, I guess like I never got booked afterwards for them. So I don't know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you're back in Saskatoon. Uh, when when did uh, I guess HIW come about? Uh, HIW, I uh just message them uh i believe at the at the time i was talking to uh a person named uh charles hayes i believe and then at the time uh, when i first joined hiw uh like they were going through changes so so cash king cash she was uh coming into uh ownership so i sent them uh an email talking to one person and then when i came to the show i was talking to a different person but um my first match with them yeah it was like in january uh i was with jeff tyler okay yeah um yeah and you know it was uh i don't know i don't know what it was probably probably was what it was i don't know <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so long <laughs> back but yeah like uh man like their that ring was like the first i guess indie ring i had because like you know when you when i went to, with lance's ring i thought all the rings were like were the same like kind of built the same so lance's ring it's like it's a feather ring so it's like it, it hurts but it, it's like it's fine you know and then when i went to uh gold dragon's ring their ring was uh it was all right it was it was fine and then when i went to uh hiw to their ring and like that first bump i was like oh i was like good god man i was like oh that's uh and like and then I think I was talking to somebody, somebody was asking me, so how'd you like that ring? And I'm like, oh, like, what do you mean? He's like, it's not like Lance's ring, is it? I'm like, no. <laughs> so, uh, so you spent some time in HIW, of course. Uh, 
former HIW tag team champion as well, too. What was that experience like getting to be a part of a, a you know, what I would say a legendary tag team in this, uh, this area of Canada? Uh, it was great, man. Uh, I had a great run with Kid Chocolate. Uh, that was probably a, a, a real fun time in my career. And I think, you know, it kind of brought a little resurgence to like to to feel deadly um yeah i don't know like uh i just, i enjoy i can i enjoy that time like uh working with against like los rudos and then uh with western lions uh the three the three the three matches that we had at one at uh i believe uh spring meltdown and then uh at uh Battle arts, and then like the following month uh, at Wildside. So yeah, no, I had a. I wish it was a bit longer, but obviously there were some things going on in the company that kind of maybe stopped their stopped it from uh, going further. But that was I had a I had a great time uh, doing the whole death by chocolate. Hope we cross paths and can do another run. That would be great. Uh, so as you were saying, obviously a little bit of difficulties within HIW, which inevitably led to the closing of HIW. Uh, before the approach from Prairie Pro Wrestling, were, uh, how aware were you that uh, there was going to be something else that come into Saskatoon area? Um, I did hear, did hear about it, uh, about a potential another company coming in. Um, when they reached out to me, I believe it was for that. Uh, I think uh, for that f- first uh, like food truck wars. I think uh, yeah. uh, when I, they contacted me about that, um, I was honestly happy uh, that there would be another promotion in Saskatoon. I would, maybe I was worried about uh, how it would how it would work. I don't know if. Uh, if maybe I don't know, there'd be some people might not want to work for somebody uh, for somebody else other than HIW out of loyalty, but you know, uh, I think Saskatoon. I think with the Prairie Pro Wrestling, we have a diverse like diverse product, diverse talent, a uh, good mix of like people that were with HIW and people that weren't with with HIW. So I I think I don't know, I think it's. I think it's more it's a good mix of like the of like the old and like the new. I don't know if that makes sense. Like sure like with like like with the styles and stuff. Yeah, you bet. It's been a nice uh nice blend get to see some new faces that weren't working with HIW work with some of the greats that were so that uh that clash has really excited the fans and I think drawn a really nice audience here in Saskatoon to the oh, yeah. Pro shows. Like, oh yeah, like we have Prairie Pro Wrestling, like uh, we have a tremendous fan base. Like you, you've been, to, like, you've been to the show, just like yep. you know, and just just to see it, you know, uh, like the the amount of love that we get, you know, it's uh, it's it's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, it truly is. Now, speaking of Prairie Pro Wrestling, the Prairie Pro Wrestling Championship still has not been awarded to any, anybody, but you made it past the first round. You're in the second round of the Prairie Pro Wrestling Championship tournament. I am. Obviously, we had a little bit of a setback with the COVID and yeah. stuff like that. But again, we are going to go forward. We're going to get to see Phil Deadly in round two. What's it going to take for Phil Deadly to go all the way in this championship tournament? Honestly, man, I got to Phil Deadly. What Phil Deadly has to do is pull out things that I have been wanting to show you guys about waiting for the right moment and i believe this me being close but yet so far from winning the the uh, ppw championship this is a uh, what better time than to show everybody the boys in the back the locker room the office and you guys the fans to see what phil Delic can actually bring to ppw Looking forward to that uh, going down. Hopefully we'll get to see that coming up very, very soon. Uh, anything else you want to tell? Any other wrestling related stories that you got for everybody today? Oh, man. I, uh, so where to begin? Um, <laughs> I think, well, I think, well, you talked to, uh, I, 
I think at one of the, I think at the last battle art show, I think there was a, like a HIW camp, uh, like tryout. And I, I, uh, I briefly touched on it, how like I, some, sometimes to, to make it, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta move, put yourself out there. And I told, uh, the brief story about when I moved to Los Angeles to further my, my training. Yeah. So when I did that thing in 2016, I left because I felt at that time I was stagnant and I wasn't, I wasn't uh, getting better in my ability to perform. And so I guess, and that also at that time, because of that, like, I don't know where I fit in, in the landscape of the Western Canadian pro wrestling scene and so i figured okay i gotta somehow make a a change i gotta figure out something i uh, so uh i contacted lance he said there was a wait list i'm like no i'm not gonna wait and the year prior i went to the uh hardy race camp and uh i talked to them about maybe coming down there to uh to train to live down to live in the dojo they had a room in the back was, uh, they had like a, a gym in the building. Was like every, they had everything, but it was like middle of nowhere, Missouri, like some small town, a couple hours away out of St. Louis. So I'm like, ah, I don't know if I want to be stranded in the middle of nowhere. And so uh, then uh, I was talking to somebody, and somebody said, "Oh, uh, Brian Kendrick has a school in LA. Go check them out." So I sent them an email. They're like, yeah, come on down. Um, uh, the only thing is you got to find your own place to stay. So I'm like, okay. So I get down to, I moved, I moved to LA uh, for like three months. Uh, the first day uh, of, of training, um, I was surprised at like how chill like he was. Uh, like he's very, uh, he's, he's almost like Lance. Like he's very, very calm, very patient. Um, yeah, uh, that that whole that time there. I think that's where, I, like, I like with Lance. I I compared it to Lance taught me how to how to bake a cake. You know, like you get, you get your flour, your eggs, uh, what your sugar, whatever else you put in a cake, and then with uh. Brian Kendrick, I learned, you know, how to add, you know, like, like the second top to a cake, how to add the frosting to the cake, uh, you know, like chocolate chips, just like the, the, the little extra sprinkle that makes, that makes the cake kind of like pop. If that makes good. If that, if that makes sense. Well, for sure. And that can be seen in your work with Prairie Pro Wrestling. I mean, you've definitely become one of the massive fan favorites amongst the uh, PPW Nation there at ringside. Oh, yeah. and, and it shows you've made a real true connection with the fans out there and they absolutely love you. And it shows in your work, too. Well, thank you, man. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that's just I uh, got that from there. Um, and uh, I guess wrestling stories there. Uh, I remember on the last day of class, uh uh, Rob Van Dam just like just uh just came in. Uh, well, like well, when I was there, like it was a, like a couple a couple guys came in, uh, like Chris Hero would pop uh pop in one day casually, uh, a couple times. Uh, Katie Forbes popped in a couple times. Uh, well, I don't know, like before, like uh, I think uh before like like I don't know, if it's bad to say. Before me too, Joy Ryan popped in. Like I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I understand. Yeah, yeah it's like I, you know, it's like, um, and uh, like, and I remember uh, before the last day, uh, he said to us, Brian, just a heads up, uh, Rob Van Dam will be might be coming in tomorrow. Uh, if he does, don't mark out. Don't ask for a picture. Just go up to him, shake his hand. Say like, okay. And so yeah, he came in the the, the last day uh, with his training like his uh wife his wife now katie forbes and you know we came in we stood in line shook his hand shook his hand and then guess what happened so was that one guy in class that one guy in class yeah <laughs> <Don't ask. laughs> he asked he asked uh, he asked for a picture and uh it's surprising like rob he didn't he didn't uh he didn't blow up or anything he just said no 
And then like, you know, and then uh, Brian just saw like uh, this, like we all like just turned to Brian and we saw like his, like that, like that look, like that look in the eye where like, you know, your parents, when you're, when your parents say, oh, like, don't touch that, like, don't touch that. And then you touch it and then they give you like that look. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, no, like he just came in one day and just kind of took over the class and like, uh, I don't know, he, he, he was just telling us, you know, like tips about wrestling. I don't know. Uh, just things, things that would help you become a better performer. Um, yeah. Uh, all right, man. That was a, that was a long time ago. I'm just trying to remember. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got a, yeah, man, not so much. Uh, okay, oh, yeah, another one. Yeah. So my first show in LA I had it was for this promotion. I guess is where Bailey used to train at. Okay. And so uh, I uh, I go there, and I'm working this guy. His name was uh, Devin Danger. Then I'm like, oh man, I, like I can't use Phil Deadly. Like we, we can't have a Deadly and a Danger going against each other. <laughs> it's like it's it, it's, it's gonna it's gonna mess mess things up. So I actually like debuted like a new character that i've wanted to kind of at least bring out once at a show uh his name is jerry curl and like uh and so and i got this time on how like yeah like maybe three years experience and so uh i go, i go to the show i give him a promo picture and he's like hey phil you're in the you're in the main event and i'm like what he's like yeah you're like I, I, at that point, like I shouldn't be in the main event. Like you know, like I, like I can be honest with myself. I shouldn't be in the main event. I shouldn't have been in that main event at that time. And so, uh, like me and this guy, whatever. He's like, this guy is normally normally a, I guess a heel, but he's uh, I guess he's a like, yeah, I'm gonna be a face. Just call it out there. I'm like, <gasps> and so <laughs> like I go I go out there, and like. Uh, we uh, we, know, we danced a little bit then I go outside I saw Jaw Jack in like with this guy in the crowd and I get counted out so I'm so like just talking trash to, to this guy trying to get heat that like that like I lose the match within the first 10 seconds because I get counted out and I and like and then once the once the ref rang the bell I was like oh my god <laughs> and so like I'm looking back and uh, the, the guys just give me like a look like 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 what are you doing and so, uh, like, we get back in the ring, and then, uh, luckily, like, uh, I guess, like, um, uh, the referee, not the referee, the, the GM of the show came out and just said, hey, we're not going to leave the fans like this. Please throw out the match. And the match was just trash. It was just, uh, <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Things yeah. happen. It was, oh, man. oh, no, like, no, like, it was, like, I, I was, like, I was laughing at it. Like, looking back, like, I was just... Uh, I was just, yeah, it was just, it was just hilarious. Like it was just hilarity. It was just like, yeah, it was just everything that could go wrong, like went wrong. So it was yeah. just, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry, man. Yeah. Dude. Oh, no, it's all, yeah. Good. it's all good. Yeah. But if uh, I'll, I'll end with one last question anyway, if you had one opportunity to wrestle anybody that you've ever been a fan of, doesn't matter who it is, who would that uh, be? I could wrestle any, any. I'm sorry, say that again. If you could wrestle anybody, anybody throughout history, if you could have a one on one matchup, who who's your dream match? Oh, oh man, I don't. That's so <laughs> bad. Putting you on I, the spot. <laughs> no, no, I think that's uh, um, I'd say the uh, people, the uh, I guess, well, like to, to make it, uh. For like the the people that have I guess helped uh, helped me in my career, I would say I'd say these guys. I'd say uh, like and like in an actual match, non training match. Uh, I'd say uh, Lance Storm, um, Brian Kendrick. Um, this guy, uh, some people might know him. Uh, they might not. When I was in Mexico uh, last year, I was training with this guy named Chessman. Okay. Yeah, he, uh, he he works for AAA predominantly. Uh, he trained Taya Valkyrie when she came to Mexico. Um, that the uh, Chessman and uh, Conan actually. Uh, Conan helped me uh, guess get settled settled into Mexico. 
Um, actually, I, I, if you don't mind, can I tell that story real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm say, I'm yeah. Say last no, it's all good. You said he said one question. Oh, no, um, no, we got time. We got time. We got time. Okay, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, me going to Mexico, uh, how that came about, I actually don't know. I just was like, I need, a, I want to go somewhere and wrestle. That's like, no, I can't. That's not Canada. <laughs> and so uh, I picked Mexico, but I kind of didn't know like where to go in Mexico. Like, like I knew of C- CMLL, um, like, and uh, I knew AAA, but like, I don't know, like how to, how to get a hold of, of who, like, who to talk to and like the language barrier and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, CWE actually, they were hosting like a Conan, uh, Conan like seminar chat from Mexico. And at this point I was really planning to go to Mexico. So I kind of, Maybe it's the wrong attitude to have going in, but I didn't care about uh, securing like a tryout swap because I was already going regardless. Like it's, it was already just you know like uh, it was already a done deal. I more so went just to kind of maybe ask some questions about where to go and like you know all that stuff. And so uh, you know like I go I go to the tryouts, uh, do my thing, and then I get lucky enough to end up. Uh, driving Conan back to you know like his hotel. Uh, we stop we stop for some chicken, talk uh, talk chicken and talk uh, talk the business. He uh, you know he put me on some on some game and we you know he like he gave me his contact info. And he's like yeah when you get to Mexico just uh, give me send me an email or a text and I'll tell you where to go. So oh great man thank you thank you thank you. So a couple months pass. Uh, I get to Mexico and funny thing is, okay, you know how we're so accustomed to like, you know, I guess here, like everything being like English. Yeah. So much of, I guess maybe of a idiot I was. So I went to, I got to, I got to Mexico city. I got to the airport. So obviously I'm a call an Uber. So I get on the, I get on the, the airport Wi-Fi, and then I get onto Uber and everything is in Spanish. Oh, no. <laughs> and so I'm like, so I'm like, uh, I'm like uh, some guy like offers to pick me up. He's talking to me in Spanish. And I'm like, uh, and like I go to Google to try and use translate, but even Google is in Spanish. Yeah. So I'm just like freaking out. Like how do I, like how do I get, how to, how to like leave this airport to me, but maybe, oof, but like an hour two hours to kind of get like uh try to figure out uh, how to turn uh spanish uber into english uber but uh what to call it uh so yeah i i get i get picked up from the airport uh I get dropped off of my hostel i text conan hey i'm in mexico uh like where like where do i go and he's like oh, okay just uh call this guy named uh airy strange um if you guys i don't uh he, i know he does a lot of work with gcw and mlw it's phenomenal super innovative with his stuff uh this is contact him i'm like okay so i contact this aries guy uh and i'm like hey man conan told me to uh talk to you about just kind of following you around to come train and granted like uh you know kudos to him uh like he couldn't his English was like, wasn't that great. So like, Oh man, like, uh, I was like, man, thank you for like trying to help me out for, even though I can't speak uh, any, like a lick of Spanish, which I sh- honestly, I should have tried and learned before I went, but I just figured that, Oh, like, Oh, I'll figure it out. Like it's, it's all good, you know? Yeah. But, and so, uh, so yeah, I came meet me at this, uh, like this address, whatever. So I'll take a cab ride, uh, to like this place. And, uh, like, I don't know, like, who this Aries guys is like I googled him but like a couple guys came up so I'm like I don't know so I'm just waiting outside like this dojo I'm just like it's each guy that comes into the into the building I'm like Aries 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 and they're like no 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 so I'm like oh then I'm like so I go I go I go in, I go into the dojo and I'm just like just uh like clueless as can be like I, I can't speak Spanish I'm like I don't know where I am I'm waiting for this guy who I kind of don't know what he looks like so i'm like well i guess i'm gonna just hop into this class and just uh i don't know do whatever i'm gonna do and so uh 
some of like we were we're doing some warm ups, some lucha drills, some lucha like flips and all that kind of stuff. And then I'm I'm not like a like a flippy person, so it was like my first time like doing like any sort of like like flip at all. Like that, that involves me landing on my feet. <laughs> so I go do like this flip, and then just as 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 about to go do this flip, uh, Aries comes out of nowhere and says, "Hey, uh, no, stop." And then he's like, you, you, uh, like me? Yeah, me, yeah, come, come. So I, I so like I leave the, I leave the doors. And I guess I, like I was supposed to go to a facility where this chess man guy is uh, training. And I guess that's the opposite side of the city. And I'm like, yo, but you told me to come here. And then he's like, uh, what you call it? Uh, he's like, oh no, no, essay. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, wrong text, wrong text. And then he's like, no, no, tomorrow, tomorrow, you me, I take you to uh, to uh, what do you say? Uh, uh, uh thank you. And he said, no, tomorrow I'll take you to uh, damn. Mm. Anyways, I forgot what he said. But anyways, <laughs> yeah. Anyways, he he ended up taking me to Chessman where I where I started training with in Mexico, and uh, and then I pretty much just kind of stuck with this Chessman guy the entire time I was there. Unfortunately, like for my second day of training, I I sprained my LCL, so I couldn't really actually wrestle in Mexico. Like I had like one match, uh, like a three on three match. Uh, I mean, like a six man tag, but I couldn't uh, really do much just because of my injured leg. So, um, yeah, that's kind of my story in Mexico. Uh, it, obviously, it got cut short too because of COVID. You know, um, came back home thinking that just like everyone else, oh, it, it'd be over within a couple months, you know, and then. Guess not, but uh, <laughs> yeah, we are 19 months later. <laughs> yeah, 19 months yeah. later. Yeah. yeah, and so like I, I do plan on going. I think my my current goal uh, within the within for 2022, aside from winning the PPW Championship, <laughs> is going is that uh, taking that title to uh, Mexico when I go back. Yeah. Well, that would be great to have the PPW Championship held up in Mexico somewhere. Oh, love it! I love the sounds of that. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So any so any questions? Like, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I've been going off on tangents and here and there. So no, this, this is, is my first perfect. Interview. You got great yeah. stories to tell. Like, fill in the time. I love it. Absolutely love yeah. it. So no. Uh, uh, outside of wrestling, though, uh, you you mentioned about your love for music and getting into that, yeah. and you took schooling for it. Uh, is there ever any aspiration once the wrestling comes down, uh, winds down a little bit, to uh, get back involved with the music side? Um. Well, like when I I stopped music because i think like uh, i was doing it for about f- five six years and just one day honestly like 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 the uh, the fire just went out and like i tried forcing it. i just had no desire to uh, touch anything like music related i kind of just packed all my gear up tossed in the closet because music is one of those things man it's like you know like like sometimes i remember it would take me maybe like I would spend like eight hours just trying to mix like this one drum just to get like the right sound. And like, it's just, it was just so time consuming. I think that kind of burnt, burnt me out of burnt that burnt me out from it. But like, I'd say in the past year, two years, like the, the urge has been coming back a little bit, like to, to try to maybe dabble a little bit in it. Like I sub I sub all my equipment, you know, all my mixing boards, my, speakers my little toys and stuff yeah um so i think i will i think i will uh get back into it not necessarily after wrestling but uh maybe turn it into a hobby as opposed to make it as a career into a career aspiration for sure yeah, yeah man yeah it makes a lot of sense so yeah uh, but yeah that's really kind of all the questions i have i mean you really filled the time perfectly telling great stories uh, like this has just been absolutely awesome so glad that we got to do this uh before we do wind up though is there anywhere on social media anything like that you want to plug right now where everybody can find you yeah man uh i'd say uh my instagram 
uh phil deadly so all one word uh twitter is phil deadly as well um i have a facebook phil deadly but i don't really use it so you're better off just to maybe get at me on uh, the twitter or uh, uh instagram Perfect. That's wonderful. Well, I want to thank you once again for being on the show today. It has been an absolute blast. Looking forward to seeing you again at the next Prairie Pro Wrestling show and hopefully watching you uh, rise to the top. Uh, hopefully grab that championship and be able to take it down to Mexico with you on your next trip. Uh, so thank you again, Phil, for being on the show. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thank Great you, Bobby. Time. Maybe maybe next time we can have uh, Papa Smokes on. We can do a, we can do a three-way. That's yeah. right. I'm sure he'd have a ton of questions for you. So thank yeah. you for joining. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, Bobby. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to move on right away here to the MLW War Chamber. But seeing as we're shooting the shit a little bit, Papa Smokes, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, about RUH's kind of like untimely departure here. Uh, they're calling it a hiatus. Whether or not it'll be a permanent hiatus, I, I really hope not for the sake of being a fan and knowing the great things that ROH has done over the years. But it's going to be a really tough uh, road back for them, especially considering that a lot of the talent now is starting to jump ship because they need somewhere to work. Uh, we recently saw Jay Lethal signing with AEW and having a match against Sammy Guevara recently, and rumor that the Briscoe brothers were backstage. I think I mentioned it on a few of the talks that I've done so far that, I mean, the Briscoe brothers are a much-needed breath, breath, breath of fresh air, pardon me, uh, for a you know a tag division that is definitely in need of a boost that's over in AEW. I think they would do wonders. Um, a FTR versus Briscoe Brothers match is just something I could only dream of right now, but hopefully we'll get that. And Jay Latho, I mean, just, man, does that ever get, the guy ever put a uh, foot wrong in any company he goes to? Loved his match with Sammy Guevara. And I mean, for the first time on Ring Respect Radio right here, I'm going to have to throw props to AEW. I, I feel dirty doing it, Pop Smokes, but they, they've had some decent things lately, surprisingly. Well, yeah, that's just it, is that uh, just like any company, AEW started by uh, by hiring the guys they knew, the guys they could trust, the guys they could depend on sort of thing, and it ended up being this kind of group of buddies of varying levels of skill, and uh, but... The fact is now that they've got, you know, two years under their belt and they got some momentum and there's some of the wrestlers, the, these guys all talk amongst themselves too. It's gotten around that it's it's a laid back and fun place to work. It pays well. And uh, yeah, that's just it. They've gotten some new, good new talent now. And I'm talking about CM Punk and Brian Danielson here. But of course, there have been a couple other acquisitions that have been pretty decent too. And you can see in some of the matches that I, I've speculated all along that the talent uh, bo basically kind of book and set up their own matches. They don't have uh, agents doing that stuff for them there. They might help them, but you, it's been fairly obvious that the boys do their own stuff there, which is why the CM Punk matches look professional and good, which is why Brian Danielson's matches look good and, and professional as well. So it's maybe part of a learning curve, right? That now that they're getting some good matches on some shows, they're going to pick up a little bit of momentum. And you can see the, in, the, in the entire climate of wrestling right now that AEW has the momentum, that there's uh, new fans going over to them. The, the ratings on TV still don't look good, but you have to admit that there's a, there's a feeling of momentum with that company right now. There really is, and yeah, you're right about the signings that they've been picking up. And uh, you know, we we have we've tried to avoid maybe talking about them so much on Ring Respect because we try to keep to topics that we know that we can be respectful about. There is a few times, obviously, I've got a little unhinged on a few companies and a few of the things I've said. Uh, not that I ever want to see anybody fail. I really do want wrestling to thrive, and I hope only for the best. And hopefully, maybe that this influx of talent will help to maybe you know, ground AEW into the type of company that they kind of promised they were going to be from the get-go and maybe they can eventually get there. And God forbid, maybe Pop Smokes in a year time from now, we'll be reviewing an AEW show as hard as that is to believe. But for now, we are going to review something else that we do enjoy and we know can be good, even though if you paid attention to the last episode of Ring Respect Radio, you know, I kind of really crapped all over AEW for the last two episodes of MLW Fusion Alpha. And a lot of that had to do with the build leading into War Chamber. I felt like it was soft. It wasn't quite all there. Things weren't making sense. A lot of goofy segments. 
But damn it, did I get proven wrong when it came to the War Chamber match itself. And that's what we're talking about here today, Pops folks. It's War Chamber time, MLW time, and we're going to talk all about it. And it definitely, I think that the War Chamber ended up paying off. And I think we're going to go into full detail here, starting with maybe the participants in the match. So I guess to explain to our fans, the War Chamber match, I would say, is kind of reminiscent of a War Games minus the double ring. This is more of a single ring with barbed wire over top of the ca top of the cage so that you cannot escape the cage. It's kind of my understanding of it. You have two teams of five. One starts off, flips a coin to see who comes in first. That's who's going to end up getting the advantage after the first five initial minutes. Every two minutes so after, they enter, uh, change out between the two teams until all five members of both teams are in. And that's when the finish can finally happen. Uh, did I miss anything in the rules of that one? No, I don't think so. But, uh, yeah, the first two guys fight for five minutes. Then whoever won the coin toss gets the next guy. So they get the advantage throughout the match, the one-man advantage, until the end the other team gets the last guy in. And, of course, that can be very, very important. So this was looking ugly for uh, Team Hammer right off the get-go because Contra drew that uh, coin toss toss in their favor and you would think that considering the people in there that you'd expect one of the sentai death squad members or i mean it, and this is not me crapping on him like an akiro kwan who you know kind of start things off or something but they went balls to the wall big right from the start jacob fought to the first entrant into the war chamber match and man it was going to be interesting to see who is team hammer going to send out there because here i am thinking we're going to get a kickoff between a sentai death squad member and Savio Vega or something like that. Instead, we get the surprise entrant for Team Hammer. And I think we're going to talk quite a bit about this one. And we're going to talk quite a bit about this guy because we've had the opportunity to call a match of his. First of all, I, I mentioned it on the last show that, you know, there was rumors that this could be the guy that was suggested to be Dario Cueto or Cesar Duran's brother in Lucha Underground. I was not remembering the first name, but of course, as they come out, on the screen, there it is, Matanza. He was Matanza Cueto. Tonight, he was Matanza Duran. I also didn't really want to play the whole breaking kayfabe thing and start talking about the man behind the mask, despite the fact that I was well aware of it. But what a neat little nod to the fans that did know as they brought out Matanza Duran, and he pulls the mask off, and it's our good boy, Jeff Cobb, Papa Smokes. I, I, I say... I popped. I popped for Jeff Cobb. Absolutely, absolutely. That's some. That's some great big name talent to bring in. I know that Cobb is a mercenary. He he works for a lot of different companies. He does a lot of one shots, in a lot of different companies. And this was just that beautifully done. You could see this big burly masked guy in a kind of mechanics jumpsuit sort of thing come out. And then when he took that mask off and you saw that hair and that mustache and just thought, oh my God, that's Jeff Cobb. And off with the uh, jumpsuit and here he comes down. And the look on uh, on uh, Jacob Fatu's face too, thinking, oh my God, I got a real hoss coming in here now and this is going to be a fight. And it was. Yeah, it really was. And we'll get to that in a minute. First of all, I want to talk about why it is that we would be such fans of Jeff Cobb outside of the fact that a former Olympic wrestler, good look, good in-ring work, and a sizable man at the same time. Uh, the great thing about Jeff Cobb was we got to call one of his matches. He was the Ring of Honor television champion. He defended that title against El Asesino in Saskatoon. So we got to do commentary on that matchup itself. Wonderful matchup because both those guys know how to do a great job inside that ring. But Jeff Cobb, a standout individual as it was. I remember getting to the show that night, getting there, and Jeff Cobb's just politely standing off to the side. I walk in, and he's coming up. Hey, really nice to meet you. I'm Jeff Cobb. And I'm thinking to myself, man, you don't, you don't need an introduction, dude. You're you're a former Olympic yeah. fucking wrestler. You are a beast inside that ring. Like, if anything, I should be introducing myself to you. Is there anything I can get for you, sir, kind of thing? But great class act of an individual yeah he put on a great show there in saskatoon and and the fans loved him and he still reaches out to people around here too yeah i was just gonna say he was such a good guy at the show and uh got along with all the boys in the back was very respectful had some laughs had a good time took a bunch of pictures and tweeted about it afterwards and uh, it's kind of like we have a friend now in jeff cobb so i'll always like this guy also Every time I see him, uh, I, I feel like he, uh, 
he's you know has a has a little part of Saskatoon and PPW with him always because of his uh, appearance here and everything and just very exciting to see him on MLW I, I definitely was surprised and uh, pleasantly so when I saw him on mask now I'm praying that this means that he's going to stick around MLW because the best part of this five, first five minutes is Jacob Fatu and Jeff Cobb beating the living piss out of each other in that war chamber match these two I mean physically are about the same physical size I mean Jeff Cobb might have a little bit on Jacob Fatu in the thickness category, but height-wise, physical size, they're about the same, and both boys can move around that ring. And damn it, if this first five minutes didn't make me go, man, I would love to see a Jacob Fatu and Jeff Cobb match one-on-one -on -one sometime down the road. And it was nice because they faced off in the middle eye-to-eye, -eye, nice little sh showdown there at the beginning, and they started off with a, a spot I'm not particularly fond of, but trading the forearms in the middle, and they traded a couple of those forearms, which looked kind of so-so, and then Jacob Fatu just winds back and just a massive slap across the face. Yeah. Such a hard slap. Looked so good, and that's just that's just Fatu in a nutshell. Like You, you give him a nice, respectful forearm, and he's just going to slap the piss right out of your mouth and... Uh, God damn, did that look good, and I, I very much enjoyed that. These two, I think it was good that they had two big names in at the beginning because they had that five minutes where they needed to warm up the crowd to the rest of this match, and man, it worked perfectly. There was another spot where uh, Cobb had uh, fought two up for a vertical suplex kind of thing and was holding him up, and then just the way he just threw him down like a sack of trash, like it... It, it looked uh, not so much like a pro wrestling spot, but just like, get off of me, man. Like, just get out of here. It, it had a look of realism to it, and it started it out uh, like a house on fire. It was good stuff. Yeah, I love the first five minutes here. I love the whole match <clears throat> in general, but uh, we'll get into that a little bit more. I'm going to ask you who you had written down. I kind of don't have my notes in front of me, but who, I think it was a Sentai Death Squad member that came out next, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yes, yes, it was the the... The one who we were wondering who it was, the big, tall, muscular guy. I, I really do wonder who that was. He was uh, looked like a bit of a green wrestler, as you might expect from a Sentai Death Squad member, but uh, he he fitted fit the match. There was a lot of beef in that match, and and very few small guys in that match. So uh, whoever this guy was, he was good. He did his part all right, and uh, he got tossed around too. But he wasn't just tall like I have Mods Kruger and stuff. Like, don't get me wrong, Mods Kruger's got a build on him. This guy looked shredded like a steroid ginger, ginger Mahal kind of thing yeah. with the height of a Mods Kruger. I mean, this was an intimidating looking dude. And, you know, normally the De Sentai Death Squad <laughs> members seem to be fully clothed for the most part. And they had no problem with wanting to have this guy have his shirt off in this matchup to prove just how big he was. In fact, they make a big deal out of EJ and Duca and his physical size and not to say he's not a big boy that's shredded, but damn, this guy <laughs> looked like he had even EJ and Duca beat on the shredded category. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, it just, it just makes you wonder who it was. Maybe it was, uh, an established wrestler that they brought in for a one shot and said you'll be wearing the mask or whatever or is it one of their guys in developmental that they have plans for later who knows but uh uh the guy was definitely uh, uh over performing for the role of sentai death squad he looked good <laughs> yeah he really did uh who in your notes came out for team hammer up next um, it was Savio with the kendo stick. There we next. go. No, even out the score with Savio and a kendo stick. So this is where, um, I mean, it gets a little bit goofy, but again, it's a war chamber. Obviously, there's no rules. Savio carries that kendo stick everywhere he goes. And I mean, at his age and everything, I, I feel maybe the kendo stick was his saving grace getting into a match with this much beef and this much young uh, explosive talent at the same time. I think mean, Savio held his own. I have the utmost respect for Savio as a worker, as a wrestler, and everything he's accomplished in pro wrestling. Um, I, he, he, to me, he still felt like the odd man out in this matchup, even though Jeff Cobb got added last minute. Even Jeff Cobb's introduction felt a little bit more like it made sense compared to Savio's kind of like insertion on the last episode of Alpha. But again, nothing Savio did was offensive here. He held his own. He played his part. And it, it looked good for the most part. I, I got nothing 
negative to say about Savio in this one. Yeah, I think it was pretty all right. And uh, I I think he was kind of just a body there in a way too to fill out the team. But uh, like you say, uh, he's a little bit older, a little bit less uh, physically imposing than some of those guys. So the, bringing the stick in kind of like uh, evens the score a little bit. And uh, this wasn't too bad. But then I, I felt like the match really picked up with the next entrant, which was Aikiro Kwan. Oh, yes. <laughs> Not a huge guy, but I've always liked this guy. I've always seen uh, potential in him. He doesn't look like he's super, super experienced as a professional wrestler, but he's got the nice martial arts moves. He throws them in there. His look is really cool. Uh, uh, tattoos and braids and everything. A really cool looking dude. And uh, I felt like the match picked up when he got in there because... This was when he started t- doing a f- couple of spots on each each of his opponents that were in the match. So he would go around to each guy. He put down Savio. He put down uh, everybody else in that with some kicks. And uh, I noticed in their uh, uh, packages uh, after the match when they were showing uh, highlights and such, uh, there were a few that were of Aikiro Kwan. Really good showing by the young guy. And... Uh, I felt like the match picked up once he got in there and Contra Unit now had a definite advantage in this match and uh, Team Hammer was going to have to work from underneath a little bit. Yeah, and you know, you're right about it. Business picking up as soon as he entered this match. I think this was one of the best look-ins at Akira Kwan we've had in recent memory. Um, I know he kind of was involved with that, you know, what was that 12-man elimination tag deal that they had on the last episode that I wasn't a big fan of. I don't think he got to shine in that match like he got to shine in this match. And considering that you had almost the equal amount of guys involved in the war chamber and so much going on simultaneously, you would think that it may get that much harder for a guy to stand out. But as you said, the excitement level picked up when he got in that ring. The martial arts moves were fantastic. There were some great spots and he looks good doing them at the same time too. He has the look of a guy who's a martial artist. He's shredded. He's got a nice build. You're right. The braids there add to that, the dynamic of his character. And it was a really great look and a really great night for him in general. As good as everybody else looked, I kind of feel like Akira Kwan came out of here looking more like a star than anybody else in the matchup tonight. Yeah, you could be right about that too. And and one thing I like about Kwan is He hasn't always appeared regularly with Contra stuff, but he's still there too. What I was left uh, wondering with on this uh, uh, Contra team was that initially we they had said Joseph Samael was going to be one of the wrestlers in the match. He ended up not appearing as a wrestler, and then it also begs the question of where's Simon Gotch and where's Davari. So we don't know about those guys. They're obviously not kicking around MLW right now. This is obviously by the uh, presence of the Sentai Death Squad guys. But uh, yeah, it makes you wonder what's going on in the background with Contra. Uh, some of their guys uh, not seeming to be around at this point. Yeah, it's good questions to ask and everything like that too. And I think uh, I was kind of a little disappointed that Joseph Samuel was in there. But... When we get to the ending, I kind of I, I think I see a reason why he's not, and there's going to be more story to unfold with Contra Unit in general. Uh, so yeah, so Kiro Kwan came in, really picked things up uh, from there, I believe, uh, for Team Holiday. Contra. Holiday. Or no, yeah, sorry, it would have been Holiday there for the Hammer Team. Uh, so yes, Richard Holiday come in after Kiro Kwan picked things up on that section. Um, yeah, Richard Holiday, a great uh, introduction to the matchup at this point. I uh, came in there and. Uh, you know, really picked up the pace and even out the playing field, um, Hammer's team was able to get back into this a little bit at the same time too. And, you know, um, not to get off of Holiday here for a second, but I just thought of another thing with the Kiroquan. One of the other nice things about having a guy that's not quite the physical size of everybody else in the matchup was they were able to use some swats where he got tossed around and they look really good when a big guy can toss a guy half his size three quarters of the way across the ring or up into the cage like they do. Akira Kwan was able to take some great bumps. And yeah, sorry to take away from Holiday's <laughs> talk like that just now, but I just thought of that and how great Akira Kwan was. So, But anyway, Richard Holiday, what do you think there, Papa Smokes, when he joined? Yeah, he, I like Holiday a bunch. He came in looking uh, confident and... Uh, he came in, he did some moves uh, on everybody. He did a nice uh, spot where uh, 
Jacob Fatu was climbing the ropes and uh, going to try and give Holiday a superplex and Holiday kind of reversed that into his uh, 2008 stock crash kind of spinning suplex. That looked real nice. Fatu took a great bump off of that. And Holiday came in and did some stuff and he looks pretty good. But um, ju I noticed during his two minutes he had his little flurry for the first minute. And then Contra started to take over again and I was wondering where this match was going to go because obviously we haven't seen the biggest guys on, on Hammerstone's team yet, but uh, all of the Hammerheads were down in the ring by the time uh, Holiday's uh, next entrance was going to come in, or the next entrant was going to come in after Holiday, and that was Sentai Death Squad member number two. Now, this guy didn't look nearly as good as the previous guy. He was not going to take off his shirt or jacket because, as we saw, he had a pretty big spare tire in the front there and uh, thought it might have been our buddy Bud Heavy for a second there, but I, I, I changed my mind. I don't think it was, but uh, this guy didn't look as good and uh, didn't perform as good either. But still with the numbers game, Contra was staying on top of this and uh, Team Hammer was pretty tired and, and looking like they were maybe going to go down a bit here and uh, and they needed a boost big time and they got one. Yeah, they really did. And, you know, it's funny you bring up Bud Heavy. I mean, I think just deep down we just keep hoping Bud Heavy's going to make appearances yeah. every time we turn on the TV. Yeah. I think had it not been for the fact that they had Jeff Cobb there, I would have even loved to see Bud Heavy be on Team Hammer. It would have made sense. He's gone out there to fight Mods Kruger a couple times now. <laughs> I think it would have been great to have it where... And say Cesar Duran had decided, hey, this is who you're going to get. And he throws Bud Heavy in there. And everyone, the, the expectation is he's going to go out there and get laid out and lose it for Team Hammer. And to have him go that distance and fight through it and pull through and be on the winning side, I think it just would have been a little fun, amazing touch. But hey, you know what? I'm not going to complain because Jeff Cobb was in the fucking match. So... Well, it, well, you know, we, we it's a win-win in the end, but, you know, Bud Heavy would have been such a fun addition. And, hey, Bud, if you're listening, come on, man. Sometime, head on out. We're, we we got the beers cold here in Canada for you, brother. We're waiting. We're waiting. It's got to happen one of these days. <laughs> so, But, anyway, uh, yeah, you said Sentai Death Squad member number two comes out. It's nothing really that got added. <laughs> anyway, I mean, he was, he was the body of anybody in there, even more so than Savio Vega. This was the body to add another body to the mix up uh, nothing really I, I can add to his addition to the matchup I think business really picked up again at the next entrant into this whole thing that's right and, that's right because uh, Sentai Death Squad member number two kind of kept it at a at a slow boil there nothing really happened too much but then the Team Hammer sent out EJ and Duca, and boy, business picked up after that, too. He came out like a raging lunatic, like he always does, and he's so big, just power move after power move. Man, he cleared the ring. Of, he didn't clear the ring, I suppose, of Contra, but he had them all down. Uh, spine busters, clotheslines, suplexes, throwing guys into the, into the steel links of the cage. Like, this was quite a dominant entrance and this really turned the tide in favor of the hammerheads yeah and you know what we did talk about about uh, a couple of the recent spots for ej and duca where you kind of wonder is he being pushed a little bit beyond his means and stuff like that due to his physical size and look um i think here he held his own a lot better than say in that uh, mixed tag match or the elimination tag match again i think his ring work right now is still a little bit limited and I think that comes A with size and B with inexperience and that's not to say that EJ and Duca is you know not capable of wrestling or anything like that it's just to say we got to understand one thing EJ and Duca is still very very green when it comes to professional wrestling right now he's got a long ways to go and I hope nothing but for the best for him because the guy looks like a damn star and he proved it when he walked out there he looks like someone who deserves to be at the top of a roster and he hopefully will get there. And the big power moves that he was throwing down here in this night, they all looked clean. He looked like he was putting down the right stuff. Nothing looked sloppy or out of place or anything like this. This looked like a guy who belonged in there with the stars that were already in the matchup. Yeah, yeah. And I, uh, I leveled some possible criticism towards him in the previous episode. But, I mean, 
to when I thought about that later, it's <clears throat> excuse me, it's not that uh, it's just like you said, Munson. He's he's green. He needs to be brought along at a certain pace, and and MLW is gonna bring him along. But I think they're gonna book him to his strengths right now, and that's perfectly acceptable and a good idea. If he can't get in there and uh, chain wrestle with someone or do spots or do a full technical match with somebody or uh, technical parts of matches, then just have him come in in these uh, battle riots and these giant uh, tag team matches and, and just hit some big spots. That's the way you're going to bring him along. As long as he's uh, training and learning in the background, then you can still feature him, but feature to his strengths. Uh, doing big moves on multiple guys like that, uh, spine busters, suplexes, uh, just big devastating moves, and just bring them on at, th at that pace. With a guy uh, that looks like that and has a body like that and is a marketable, good-looking dude like that, I, I believe that that is probably the right way to do it, is just to book him in a way that he'll be smashed over as this huge, unstoppable juggernaut. And if you keep him out of the out of certain matches and keep him away from certain uh, situations, no one's ever going to realize that he isn't one of the top wrestlers there, and he absolutely will be uh, one of the top faces in this company in the future. I think so. Uh, cheers to uh, to Court and Caesar and the other guys uh, calling the shots in MLW. I, I think you're doing the right thing with this guy. Get him out there. Get the fans uh, interested in him get them more familiar with him and smash him over give him some uh feed him some heels to 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 beat up and to smash on and uh he will come along uh, as as at his own pace and and i think this is the way to do it with this guy and that that's exactly what they're doing you want to get him over they need to get our boy robert martyr in there i think he gets yeah. some really good selling out of that one yeah well, but uh, anyway, props to you, Robert Martyr, if you're listening in as well, too, brother. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, business really picked up with Nduka, and I'm glad that we were able to sing his praises a little bit more last time. I really felt that we were really heavy-handed with some of the things we said, and I felt guilty about it with how great MLW's been. I, I, I really felt guilty about us going down such a negative path there, Papa Smokes, and I, I almost didn't really enjoy putting out that last episode of Ring Respect for the first time in a long time. Uh, for that exact reason, but I mean, this changed my whole my whole perspective, and I'm glad that we're getting to put out this positive a positive uh, episode of Ring Respect here today. Um, so there we had uh, one more guy for each team that was left in the fold at this point, I believe. So last but not least, on the side of Team Contra comes the man who has been causing a lot of dissension in among Contra lately. A lot of Things have been uh, planted in both his and Jacob Fatu's ears about who's in charge, who's leading the squad, and everything like that. And Mods Kruger comes out last but not least for Contra. And man, you're talking about, again, another big boy that's been pushed up towards the top. We're talking about an undefeated Mods Kruger here. And they've done the right things with this guy. I mean, the only one-on-one -on -one matches he has had so far that haven't been squash matches in MLW was with... Hammerstone and not one of them ever ended in any clean sort of way the first match ended in a no contest the second one ended up being that pre-taped brawl sort of thing that didn't really end up with anybody being victorious in a sense I guess it wasn't really much of anything uh, they've protected Mods Kruger very well and I think he holds his own in that ring he looks intimidating I think his promos are coming along quite nicely and improving each time I, I believe this guy and I actually like seeing this guy in an MLW ring. And I really think that he came in. He made as much as much as the, you had these big dudes in there already. He really just kind of came in and towered over them at the same time. And really put in some nice work there against everybody in the ring. Including some great spots with EJ and Duke as well too. Yeah. And, and uh, Kruger. Yeah. Just like you said. Amongst all the big guys in there. Kruger is the biggest and the meanest looking. He's the scariest looking guy. He's a perfect monster heel for this company. And uh, we don't need to know any of his background or anything. We just know that he's evil. And, and that he's a bad guy. Bent on the destruction of Alexander Hammerstone. But as we've said all along. He was never really a an organic flag bearing member of Contra. He was a mercenary that they hired for the one purpose of stopping Hammerstone per to, in order to protect uh, Fatu's title. 
And when he failed in that mission, then I think he started to fall out with Contra. And I, it seems to me that Mods Kruger had it in his own mind that maybe Contra wasn't run as well as it could be. So he started to, uh, you noticed in his promo before the show, he kind of said, I'm going to lead my soldiers of Contra into the thing. And I thought, oh yeah, the, are you not listening to Samael and uh, Fatu anymore? And I think he's starting to march to the beat of his of his own drum. When he came down the ramp to the ring, he had the another Sentai Death Squad member with him. And uh, he whispered some instructions to the guy and left him kind of guarding the outside of the ring. And I was wondering if that might come into play at some point. And uh, yes, that did too. <laughs> yes, it did. So, so obviously, last but not least, the last member to enter this matchup before any pinfalls, submissions, whatever could take place to end this whole thing. And we're talking about the man himself, the MLW World Heavyweight Champion, Alexander Hammerstone, coming out, as always, looking like a rock star to that wonderful rendition of Go With The Flow by Queens of the Stone Age, which I think is a brilliant, brilliant song to have a guy come out to, especially a guy like Alexander Hammerstone. He's got all the moves that go down to the beat of that song. He looks like a million bucks coming out there, and... I think more than anything, I was blown away by the fact that I believe it was only five or six weeks prior that this guy fractured his foot in that match with Jacob Fatu. Claims being that it would take eight to ten weeks for him to recover. And Alexander Hammerstone comes out after about five weeks, says to hell with it, I'm good to go. Gets in there in one of the most dangerous matchups you can be a part of. And man, did he go out there and fight. He held his own. He had some big spots in there. And also uh, went against the tradition of wearing the uh, long pants this time and wearing a good old-fashioned uh, wrestling speedo in there. He had uh, quite the uh, tight outfit on this on this particular evening. But he, talking about his ankle too, they they played that up a little bit in the match <clears throat> because they knew the fans would remember how recently that was. And do you remember months and how he injured that? What spot he was doing? He was doing one of those high kicks. Yep where he jumps and switches his legs kind of and uh, and does the kick from the other foot that he jumped off of and uh, that's exactly how he broke it the first time. So I noticed he did a couple of those kicks in this match. So it's not in his head anymore. Like it's got to be feeling okay. He went back to that move a couple of times. So apparently he's just fine and he looked just fine in there. Yeah, and they also uh, played on it a little bit too because the Fought 2 started attacking that particular leg of Alexander Hammerstone. And good job by the announcers at MLW to bring up the fact, in case somebody happens to be watching that hasn't tuned in before, hey, they are working the recently injured or recently recovered from injury Alexander Hammerstone on that particular foot. So I'm glad, mad props to the MLW commentators for always doing that toss back and always kind of maybe assuming that everybody tuning in hasn't followed every week to week like we have and know the ins and outs of how things are currently going together and as commentators you almost have to do that you almost have to be able to continue to tell the story it might seem repetitive in the minds of some of the people that follow week to week but you can't assume that everybody every single week is going to be the same crowd over and over you're always hoping to draw in new eyes to the to that and I think that's one thing that they do very well with the commentary at MLW yeah yeah and uh wasn't it surprising to see Jacob Fatu just lock up Hammerstone in that ankle lock like that? You don't see too many holds from uh, Jacob Fatu or not not uh, submission holds like that. It was quite interesting. You knew it was on his mind. You knew he was like a shark with blood in the water. He was going to go for any weak area he could find on Hammerstone, and he sure did. He really did, yes. And I guess the true turning point of this entire matchup would have had to have been where uh, Jacob Fatu went to the top ropes to perform that. Uh, what, 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 how, how would you name that? Uh, that's like a corkscrew spinning moonsault of some sort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that'll do. Okay. So anyway, he goes to hit that with the intent that it was going to be Alexander Hammerstone that he was going to nail with it. Ends up inadvertently, or we believe inadvertently, ends up taking out Mods Kruger, which inevitably led to the finish of this matchup. We ended up with a Team Hammer win up win out of this thing uh so it seems like team mlw or hammers team has finally defeated the evil contra this would essentially bring an end to this story but a new little story would unfold pop smokes and i know we've been itching to talk about this the aftermath of what happened in 
I'm not always a big fan of aftermath after matches, but this aftermath, this worked. And it worked a lot. I, I'm going to let you set the scene here and we'll talk about it. Yeah, this was so tremendously well done. Uh, I wanted to bring up quickly before we get to this one other huge spot that was massive for me was Hammerstone hitting the Nightmare Pendulum oh, on Mads yes. Kruger. My yes. God, was that huge and was that ever well done? It's just and, clean. Oh, <laughs> Beautiful. It's such a great move. I, I don't know where he got that or if he invented that. I don't want to know. He, he does it so good. But you notice in the Fatu Hammerstone title match when Hammerstone injured his ankle, he didn't do the nightmare pendulum on Fatu. And I, I suspect that he was, it was slated for him to do. He was going to do it, but didn't trust that ankle that he could get the big guy up there and perform the move properly. So he did that kind of modified F5 type thing, and it worked. It was fine. They they, they went home and got, got done that match just fine. But here's another sign that Hammerstone's all better. My God, he got the seven-foot guy up for that full vertical suplex position again and then swung him right down. Kruger's legs didn't hit the mat, which is kind of how, if I was wondering if, if he could even yeah. do that move on a tall guy like Kruger, but... Caught him down. My God, that was impactful. The camera shots missed the setup of it, but they managed to get the actual execution of the move. And who did he hit the mat hard with Hammerstone on top of him? And that looked beautiful. I had to get that in there because I popped hard for that. Yeah, and I'm really glad you brought it up because, I mean, it's not that I forgot. I just forgot to mention it. And now you brought it up. Like, I'm just thinking about it. And I remember even turning to the wife as she was watching this with me at the time and I'm like look I was like I'm gonna rewind this shit right now because that dude right there I said just picked up a dude that they're they're saying is seven foot three again we know wrestling can bend the rules a little bit but I'm not doubting for a minute that Kruger is pushing seven feet or in around that seven foot mark yeah and so a tall dude like that going up like that as it is is impressive enough but Anyone who doesn't know, go watch Hammer perform the Nightmare Pendulum. And the fact that he not only has to hold a dude of that weight straight up in the air, but he's got to swing that momentum back around and get Kruger to a point where he can take a clean bump. Because up to a certain point, that's all Hammer. It's got to oh, yeah. be all Hammer. And he's got to be there to protect his opponent. As much as I don't like to break kayfabe, we're going to break it a little bit here. But he has to keep who he's fighting protected to a certain degree. So he isn't dropping these guys on their head. Or like you said, a guy like Mods Kruger, seven feet, if his feet would have fucking hit that ground, then he could have broken both of Mods Kruger's ankles in one shot right there. And he didn't. It was a perfectly clean bump. Everything about it went beautifully. And damn, Bob Smokes, thank you for bringing it up. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I, I love that part. But yeah, only, only a few minutes later... Uh, Alexander Hammerstone uh, gets Ikiro Kwan up in the Human Torture Act too. Another great move for Hammerstone to do, reminiscent of Lex Luger and various others that have used that. But racks up the smaller man, and oh, he he was applying that pretty hard. I was <laughs> yeah. thinking like, Kwan must be pretty uh, flexible because his back was bent and real bad, and Hammer was bouncing up and down and just working Kwan's back. <laughs> He submitted immediately, and uh, he dropped him like a sack of trash, and that was the end of the match, and uh, kind of just mildly disappointing to me that Ikiro Kwan had to do be the fall guy when there was two Sentai Death Squad dudes in there, but whatever. Uh, but keep, uh, keeping in mind, the Sentai Death Squad guys had been cleared from the cage by EJ and Duka at the same time. They were to the outside of the cage when it happened. Right. How, how perfect. How perfect. But yeah. anyway, yeah, the... Uh, the uh, match finishes. The Hammer and his boys uh, take a few bows in there and uh, shake some ropes and get the fans going a bit, and then they split. But now it's it's just Contra unit left in there, and and uh, Mads Kruger is is taking a issue with Jacob Fatu coming up to him, grabbing him, pulling him around like what the hell was that sort of thing. Because they had a couple of little incidents where there was some accidental contact. Uh, I know that Fatu ran into the corner to squash someone one time and got Kruger instead. And then that as that moonsault spot, that was a big move that landed clearly on uh, Kruger. 
His hammer still moved and shoved Kruger into the way in. So you knew that there was some uh, anger building up in there just from the, the pain of the spots that happened there and everything, but they had also teased that there was dissension among the ranks in Contra. Now you've got these two monsters, Jacob Fatu and Mads Kruger, face-to-face, -face, and now they're throwing punches at each other, and Aikiro Kwan's trying to break them up, trying to... Uh, trying to, you know, get a little solidarity among the boys, and then it just got worse from there, and oh, now they're, now Fatu's throwing Quan across the ring and getting him out of there, and this brawl happened, and they brawled all around the cage, and then outside the cage, and then all in the, uh, not exactly in the crowd, but all at the ringside area, and I thought that, uh, this was shocking enough to the fans and everything to see Contra Unit fighting amongst themselves, but the uh, MLW emptied the back of extra referees, extra talent they had. Everyone kind of dressed in black in the professional, uh, you know, guys working at the show kind of thing. They all came out. There had to be 20 guys out yeah. there breaking up that fight, 25 guys maybe. And this had the look of extreme realism, and I really, really thought this was extremely well done and um the 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 boys Kruger and and Fatu had it like the rage on their faces was insane and and uh the they still had some uh spots where they broke away and, and fought a little bit and then would get broken up again and you know I like spots like this but uh, a lot of companies do them and and I don't think they do them particularly one particularly well pardon me but um this one i knew was done well because i could feel it inside me this this harkened back to many um similar uh spots i've watched in wrestling that worked well in the past and then the other way i can tell is while you're watching a spot like that look at the looks on the faces of the fans you could see the unsure and kind of scared look on so many of those ringside fans faces because once you get up close to those wrestlers that are so huge and there's a whole bunch of guys trying to break up their crazy fight and they can't you can see that look of concern and i like that in those old japanese matches from the 80s too and brody and hansen and abdullah the butcher and all those guys would be raging out in the audience and you could see the real fear on the faces of the fans this wasn't quite to that extent but I, I rewound and watched some of the fans faces because you can see that they're not exactly like totally fearful but they're not smiling either and they're there you can see the unsurety on their faces of just I'm not sure what's going on here and I, I hope this doesn't involve me because once you once you have the the uh, solidarity and the uh, the the safety of the fans just in question a little bit like that then your spot looks really real and when the, those ringside fans have that look on their face that's when i know it's going good and this was a great example of that and you know what 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 also adds to the realism is the fact that you could give jacob fought to the f-bomb championship of the world because yeah. when he's going at uh, especially right off the hop when they, you know, uh, Kruger first pie faces him there and stuff like that. And you turn around and you're hearing Jacob Fatu say things like, how dare you do that, motherfucker, or something like that. Or like, And then Narkira Kwan gets in between and like, I'll fucking hit you too, motherfucker. And he's dropping these things. But this is how most dudes I've ever met would talk if somebody's trying to push them around or get in a fight with them. You know, an unexpected fight that needs to be pulled apart. I expect two guys to be calling each other motherfuckers and going at each other like that. I don't expect them to be, you know, patting each other on the back and shaking hands. And this was so brilliantly done in that sense. And up until this point, I didn't know I wanted Jacob Fatu versus Mods Kruger matchup or feud or anything. But damn, now I want Jacob Fatu and Mads Kruger. I think this has been built brilliantly. I think that uh, knowing MLW's history, this isn't going to be, you know done on free television in a week or two either at the same time this will get paid off in the right way at the exact right time and and it seems like uh it's clear cut with this too because even before this match the fans when fatu comes out the fans chant for him like they like him that's how good he is he's a stone cold heel but they still like him because he's badass and he's cool 
So when this fight happened at the end, it was still clear as to who was the hated guy and who was the babyface kind of thing because the fans all know and like Fatu better. My only question now is what will happen with Contra unit? Will Mads Kruger be kicked out of Contra and just be a heel fighting uh, Fatu in it? Or is Fatu going to quit Contra over some... uh, backstabbing incidents possibly by Joseph Samael. We don't know yet where the uh, story is going to go, but um, it seems clear that this will be their big match for the next little while. I'm just not sure of uh, the kind of uh, structure they'll have around it in terms of Contra unit, which member will actually stay with Contra unit and which won't. Or does Contra Unit completely dissolve altogether and we see something new form from all this? Uh, we'll be waiting to see and a great thing to be able to say is that uh, we don't know. And that's what we want as wrestling fans. We don't know, but we want to know and we want to find out. And that's what keeps us tuning in to shows that put on by MLW. I think it was fantastic. Uh, before we wrap up here, obviously we both loved MLW War Chamber. So mad props to you guys for that show. But I just remembered that there was an announcement at the start of the show that I forgot to bring up here, and I think that we could finish the show talking about it. Cesar Duran came out, and yes, it's official. uh, Coming up here right away, in fact, in December, MLW's heading to Mexico for basically Azteca Underground. It's uh, MLW Azteca is the name of the show. I believe these are, I I don't know if this is going to be multiple tapings for fusion purpose or if this is going to be one big show that they're going to put out yet. I don't know the details there. Uh, but that's fine. I don't need to know the details. I just look forward to it. Uh, your thoughts on them uh, going international, Papa Smokes? Yeah, as we've always uh, said on this, we like that they do international stuff like that. It gives a nice uh, sense of seeing some uh, wrestlers from different parts of the world and different styles. They have a kind of thing going on with Azteca Underground and and seem to share talent with AAA Lucha as well. So I would guess that they're probably going to do a set of tapings like they just finished in Philly with a whole bunch of TV matches capped off by maybe a couple of bigger events uh, such as Battle Riot or War Chamber, but different ones, right? And this will be fun, I think. I'm interested in everything about this. Uh, I'm not sure what kind of talent they'll be using or what kind of uh, what the cards will look like exactly, but... I'm interested in the venue they will use, the different uh, Mexican fans, uh, and just everything's a little bit different down there, and it, it just makes it fun and more flavorful to watch. Yeah, and Duran te- teased the uh, floor plans and everything like that, and made reference to the temple as well, too, and the temple was very known as the place where Lucha Underground took place. So a lot of those references seeping in, but I'm looking forward to especially seeing the reaction from some international fans for MLW. I want to see what kind of crowd it brings out, their reactions to the different stars of MLW as well, too. I think that would give us a real feel for how these guys are doing on on a worldwide basis, and hopefully maybe we'll put more eyes on MLW at the same time because, you know, nothing uh, puts more eyes on it than bringing it overseas to other countries and getting them in front of audiences that maybe haven't been tuning in yet but would love to go to a live wrestling show that they know is in town with some stars that they might recognize as well too. So, mad props to you, MLW. Thank you for making me believe in wrestling again after I kind of crapped all over you the last couple of uh, times. So uh, thank you for War Chamber. It was fantastic. I loved every minute of it. And I'm looking forward to what you guys got coming up. I believe uh, this week, in fact, tomorrow night after we record this, they will have MLW's uh, Fusion Alpha that takes place on Thanksgiving. So I believe, if not mistaken, Papa Smokes, they're crowning the uh, National Openweight Champion on this matchup. This is a five-man ladder match here. So I know a lot of fans are really into those types of things. I think they've... Really done a lot of the gimmicky matches lately, and I wouldn't mind it seeing something a little bit more on one-on-one or even seeing maybe a matchup and then the winner of that taking on the winner of the Opera Cup for the championship. But hey, you know what? I like the lineup of the guys that have been announced for this particular matchup. So I guess I, I at the same time, I'm not going to complain because I think we're going to get some interesting spots. You got Zenshi. I mean, I can imagine what Zenshi's going to do in amongst a ladder match of all things. Uh, Alex Shelley... Uh, we got Alex Kane. 
I know I'm missing somebody else, Papa Smokes, that I'm going to kick myself for Myron missing. Myron Reed. There we go. Is in it, I yes, think. Myron Reed is in that one as well, too. I apologize, Myron. I forgot that one. And there I, might be a, a yet to be named person in it, right? Yeah, who is knows who right? this could yeah, be? Yes, I it's a, so. they say they keep teasing that this could be someone already on the roster. It could be someone from outside of the roster. Could this be somebody that's making their MLW debut? Uh, someone we're not expecting. Uh, I, I look forward to seeing it and finding out what goes down. I think it should be a great matchup. Um, again, I'm looking forward to seeing where they go with the National Open Weight Championship after Hammer held it for so long and so uh, so well. At the same time, I want to see who that this belt goes on next. I mean, if I was to take an early prediction, I'm thinking Alex Kane, the way he's been built and everything like that. But who knows? There could be. Calvin Tankman sunk into this matchup all of a sudden we know he's had his problems with Alex Kane so it could go a multitude of ways I'm looking forward to it and hope everybody else will too uh tune in this Wednesday night as you enjoy some turkey day with our good friends in the United States uh for watching MLW Fusion on Thanksgiving uh but that's going to wrap it up for us here on Ring Respect Radio we hope that you enjoyed this show of two guys just shooting the shit as bros and talking some wrestling. If you like what we do here, make sure to show us some love with that subscribe button down below. Give us a like. You know, maybe shout us out on social media. Tell other people that we exist. And you know what? Give us some topics to talk about. Because we like talking about some pro wrestling. Thank you for tuning in. And we'll catch you next time. When you go to the old saloon at the Dead South End, Gonna find you a man there wants to be old friend. Put no down.